1995 at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He is currently an associate professor in theoretical cognitive science at the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior at the Rabu University Nijmegen, where he runs their research group, Societal Implications of AI and CNS. His research focuses on the implications of cognitive neuroscience and artificial intelligence for society and also human self-understanding. He investigates the ethical and societal implications of research in CNS and AI, such as robotics, brain-computer interfacing, and deep brain stimulation. He is particularly interested in the integration of empirical work with philosophical issues regarding uh, knowledge, identity, agency, responsibility, and intelligent behavior. He is published in the most renowned scientific journals, such as Nature, Biotechnology, Science and Engineering, Ethics, and the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. So as I said earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to put them um, uh, in the chat or in the Ask a Question feature, and we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So now, Professor Lahar, we are very pleased to have you with us today, and the floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation and thanks everyone for being present. I, I'm really enthusiastic about the possibility to talk for such a great uh, initiative uh, because I do think that unifying AI and cognitive neuroscience is a truly great idea. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I have, I think, an important question to ask, or at least an important question to me, for what purpose? What do we want to do? We're, we're standing in a, a time frame, 21st century, where the amount and depth of knowledge that we have about our brains is truly enormous. It's impressive. Uh, lots to be discovered, no doubt, but but the kind of knowledge and the speed with which it increases is, is really impressive. At the same time, we also fathom a, a technology, uh, artificial intelligence, that is extremely influential in a lot of domains. And so for me, the question that is raised by that combination of deep insight into ourselves, into at least part of our causal machinery, and the capacity that we have to, to develop all kinds of very powerful technologies, that raises the question, what are we going to do with this? And, and, and just to explain this a little bit, let me, let me show you uh, how I got to this topic. And so I, I sometimes get asked to talk about, for instance, super intelligence. And, well, you all know uh, Kurzweil, Bostrom, of course, there's different levels of quality and detail, uh, Techmark, uh, interesting book, uh, many others. Um, I also get asked to talk about neurotechnology, brain reading, brain computer interfacing, brain stimulation, you know, and then uh, transhumanism, for instance is a, a conference where I, I was invited to talk. And to be perfectly honest, and I hope I don't violate any code of conduct, the topics of super intelligence and transhumanism um, annoy me a little bit, irritate me. Because for me, if I may say so, they scratch an itch that to me doesn't sound the most urgent. And so I, I, I try to understand my own irritation or annoyance with transhumanism and, and super intelligence. And at some point, uh, you know, I, I, I started getting a little bit better in explaining what the problem was. So allow me. So, so in super intelligence discussions, for instance, one of the big issues is, well, what are we going to ask of this super intelligence? What are the values that we would like it to defend? And so the statement is, be careful what you wish for, because you might get it. They call this the value alignment problem. You know, if we now say that we want the super intelligence to do something, then maybe 20 or 50 or 100 years later, find out that that was actually not superly well formulated, because we still see the negative effects of the super AI that really tries to do what we intended it to do. It's just that we uh, didn't formulate it very well. Bostrom has lots of examples. So this, I won't go into details. So 
Bosom then makes a very interesting point. So you have to really think wisely before you ask the super intelligence to do certain things before you define the goals for it. But he says, foolish, ignorant, and narrow minded that we are, how could we be trusted to make good design decisions? And at that moment, I thought, yes, exactly. But that is not just a problem for super intelligence. That's already a problem for artificial intelligence and cognitive neuroscience now. We are uh, maybe foolish, ignorant, especially narrow minded. So, how certain are we that we're currently trying to achieve the right kind of goals with AI and cognitive neuroscience? And so I started thinking, like, okay, you know, if you think about a historian from the future, maybe 24th century or something, looking back at us, what would they think about our attempts to apply AI and the insights that we gained from cognitive neuroscience? Would they think that we were trying to address the urgent problems of our time or that we just were, you know, missing the point entirely? And so then I, I was reminded of the feeling that I had, and maybe you share that too, uh, when I was looking at the pyramids in Egypt. You know, the one question that came to my mind when I saw this the first time, of course, many years ago. So why? You know, the, the amount of technology, the amount of energy, the amount of resources that you have, that you need in order to, to build these magnificent structures in the middle of the desert is impressive. But why on earth would you want to? And then I thought, well, maybe those historians, these imaginary historians of the future that I'm uh, sort of uh, evoking for you now, would be looking at us 3,000 years later and looking back at us thinking, yeah, well, why exactly? You know, what's, what's their, what was their goal with AI? Why were they running after super intelligence and transhumanism so, so, so you know, energetically? Um, so that's the question I want to discuss with you. What should we strive for? And of course, I, I only have some uh, half-baked ideas that I, I can offer you. So I'm very curious, actually, to hear what you think, what kind of ideas you might want to develop, or whether you disagree, it's all totally fine, of course. Um, but I think the question, what should we strive for, is intensified by the increasing technical possibilities for AI and, 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 and neuroscience. And the general idea of overcoming current human limitations, you have all these debates about human enhancement, for instance. I don't think that that's sufficient or even a desirable kind of guideline for the answer. Because if you want to improve yourself, you have to know yourself. And what you especially have to know your, uh, know well, and that's always a little bit painful, is what you don't like about yourself. You have to make a genuine and an honest SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Maybe you know from organizations, it was very popular in management studies. But especially the weaknesses, we are not so keen on formulating about ourselves, yet that's exactly what is required. So, if you look at Homo sapiens, the human species that has been dominant on this planet for quite a while now, what needs improvement first and foremost? And if you ask that question, it's not so obvious to me why we are trying to increase intelligence. Is it really true that we need to increase our intelligence first and foremost? Is that our greatest weakness? I, I have my doubts. In fact, the human species is, is very keen on explaining, maybe self-congratulating ourselves with, with the fact that we're the smartest on the planet. We, at least we say this and, and nobody contradicts us, maybe for very good reasons. But we love these kind of pictures that you see in all kinds of textbooks, you know, with the encephalization quotient or other uh, measurements that we we are not just you know smarter than all the other species but really smarter by a wide margin uh, uh, a margin uh, so so yeah we, we if you'd like at this and then yeah why why become even more intelligent we're, we're already the smartest at least we like to think so as it is and also what are the most urgent problems of our time 
uh, if you look at United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals, you know, you don't see increase in intelligence as a major issue. Maybe there's something about schooling, but that's a different kind of issue. The first problem is no poverty. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'm just fine. The second one is zero hunger, and then it's good health and well-being for all. Then quality education comes, and then equality, it's true. You can discuss about the order too, of course. But the sustainable goals point in a different kind of direction. And just to give you a few data on the, the first two, um, we tend to think that in the long run, things are improving. There's books like Factfulness and others that, that sold really well, at least in Europe, uh, that, that make that point. But if you look just at the effects of recent years of the pandemic, then that pushed an additional 88 million or even more into extreme poverty this year with a total of 150 by 2021 which is basically now and that's you know living on less than two bucks a day uh, same thing applies to hunger currently almost 190 million people in the world are undernourished that's about nine percent of the world population and that is growing, it's not going down. So, so if we look at urgent problems as identified by the United Nations, then you see problems of poverty, you see here the same numbers, but in a slightly different uh, rendering and, and extrapolated to 2030, we're kind of hairish, uh, that these problems are becoming more urgent. Um, so, so how is AI or how is cognitive neuroscience helping us to address such issues? Take, for instance, food waste. If you look at it, the numbers are really astounding. 2019, 930 million tons of food was wasted. 61% of which came from households. 70% or 18% the calculations are a little bit off in the quote there, uh, of global food production may be wasted. That's an urgent problem. What could neuroscience, what could AI do to help address that issue? But if you look at where especially AI is going, you see something actually quite different. Um, my apologies for the biased and manipulative news selection below that I give you here. You would of course find others, but I selected these carefully and for a purpose, I admit immediately. If you look at last year, then the amount of money that goes to big AI companies is enormous and increased enormously. AI is basically busy with an enormous gold rush. We're running towards the money with AI. Uh, and, and the way this money is being made becomes more inhumane, if you like, every moment. Because this technology is now used, for instance, by Amazon where you can look at muscle use and you measure fatigue in the muscles in order to see whether they can still function optimally or when they finally can get a brief break to recover and then they can you know, be squeezed again like lemons. We're building a dystopia just to make people click on ads. People want to go to a union that are being actively discouraged. If big companies like Google have to pay for news, for instance, then they want to do a boycott. So we're, we're really putting a lot of effort in an AI that in terms of its, let's say, economic impact on the planet is not really addressing the problems that I just mentioned, but just puts money on large heaps. That's a thing to consider, I would think. Similar things you see in the weapon industry. The amount of money that Homo sapiens has spent over the centuries and still is spending is mind-boggling. Billions, 2,000 billions in 2019. What does AI do? It adds to the expenditure. AI is becoming a really big military market. And we all know um, that uh, uh, DARPA, the US uh, Defense Agency uh, did a lot of funding of AI research for a particular reason. So AI, instead of diminishing that arms race, is becoming part and parcel of the arms race, which is one of the reasons why people are now 
so interested in super intelligence because if we get our super intelligence before the enemy does then we're lucky if it's vice versa we're unlucky so i see ai in this sense actually participating in a type of endeavor that is almost contrary to the goals that the united nations are formulating and an important question is what we can do with this and so just to repeat the point i'm, I'm sorry if i'm overdoing it but I, I i looked at um military conflicts in the last century and a bit so starting from 1860 this is from a web page that really tried to formulate them all and they already admitted that most likely many were were, were gone and this is you're looking at one century of history of homo sapiens the smartest species on the planet you know in the number of wars from the balkan wars the first world war the number of that is staggering 20 million second world war uh mozambique angolan vietnam war mao's cultural revolution um and the list goes on and on uh syria 2012, Mozambique, 2017, it stops at 2018. Uh, of course, we all know the list goes on. These are the problems that Homo sapiens is dealing with. So if you take that all into account, I cannot help but ask the question, you know, are we sure we need more intelligence? If a 24th or 20, 34th or 44th century historian would look back and say look these people were really 21st century science is not nothing it's no longer child's play it's getting really serious in terms of self-understanding capacity including genetics of course and in forms of communication understanding using all that knowledge to apply it etc and what were they doing with it they were trying to improve their intelligence while they were already the smartest on the planet. That's a stupid species, if you ask me. Again, I hope I don't violate any ethical code. Uh, that's barking up the wrong tree. So my main message for today and for this conference, and actually maybe for the whole project of unifying AI and cognitive neuroscience, is a very simple slogan, down with super intelligence, and hooray for super ethics. Uh, I'm not sure if people still know Monty Python. Uh, if you don't, let me explain briefly the picture that you're seeing here. It's a very brief sketch. So Monty Python were some British comedians that have some sort of cult status. And I think you should see them at some point. They're online everywhere. And this was a situation where the planet consisted of all supermen and superwomen. And they were, you know, just like Superman, Supergirl or Superwoman, they were super. But they had this tiny little problem. If they had a flat tire, there was nothing they could do about it. And so there was this one bicycle repairman that suddenly appeared as seemingly out of nowhere and then started repairing the bike. And every superman and woman was shouting, oh, bicycle repairman, bicycle repairman. I think we're in that situation. We need a improvement of ourselves in the direction of bicycle repairman, not in the direction of super smart. Okay. And if you don't like the word super, I don't like the word super. Uh, forget it. It's down with intelligence and hooray for ethics. Because, again, if you look at the history of Homo sapiens, and I just gave you a few, you know, examples, you can, you can enlarge them. I didn't even talk about climate and other stuff, you know. The problem is not that we're too stupid. I think that that's just a wrong diagnosis. The problem is not that we're too stupid. We, we do understand that if you have severe economic or political or social inequality, then that's bad in the long run. I, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to go to college to get that. We don't need to augment our intelligence in order to grasp that wars and poverty and environmental problems and extinctions are negative. And we already have the Charter of Human Rights, right? It's not like we need to formulate what the values and the ethical codes are that we need to follow. We have them. 
In fact, we have, we have too many ethical codes these days. Everybody is writing a new ethical code, but we already know the basic outline of what is good, right, or just. And we have a reasonable understanding of democracy and state of law, how that works, why that is important. So we're not too stupid at all, at all that. But what we do seem to miss is the capacity to act ethically and empathically on the insights. We know what is right for us, we just don't do it. So how can we use cognitive neuroscience and AI to improve our capacity to act consistently upon ethical principles that we all by and large know that are right? There's always something to debate, but the general direction seems too obvious to discuss a lot. And if you look at this, then I think there are many, many ways that you can address this. And just to sketch a few ways, so, so Hannah Arendt, for instance, in 1963, when she was at the Nuremberg trials, she looked at uh, Eichmann and, uh, when he got uh, into Jerusalem in 1963, and she said, well, there was nothing strikingly evil about him. He was very much involved in the organization of the Holocaust. He is you and me. And so an important question for cognitive neuroscience, I would think, is, well, what are the mechanisms behind overcompliance with or a prolonged acceptance of immoral practices? What are these mechanisms that make us, let's say, healthy, ordinary people, or not healthy, but still ordinary people, or not so ordinary, very creative, diverse, different kind of people, whatever, but what are the mechanisms that make us persevere in everyday life practices that we know are collectively damaging? And how do we manage to consistently look away from the problems we help to create? How do we avoid feeling responsible and acting accordingly? Those psychological neurocognitive mechanisms we should study because they are at least part of the reason why we don't act on the principles that we know are right. And so if you look at some of the, the work in that field, and it's, it's, it's there, but it's not really strong, not very omnipresent, doesn't get quoted all that much. Then for instance, there's something that's called syndrome E, but if you look at in the literature, you don't find extensive research lines on this, and that's exactly the question, why not? So how come that previously nonviolent individuals behave in morally disturbing ways? Or what are the mechanisms, again, neurocognitively speaking, that enable or facilitate extreme in-group, out-group distinctions? There was a president not too long ago that did his best in that regard. Or what is the phenomenon of empathy erosion, where the emotional pathways in the brain no longer affect judgments and action circuits? There's concepts here that we could use to start of that kind of research. Or how do we position ourselves or how do we get positioned probably uh, somewhere in between these extremes of selfish and selfless behavior? What are the neurocognitive mechanisms? These areas, there's some knowledge about it, but it's not applied across the board. It's not, you know, approached in a systematic way, um, which cognitive neuroscience could do if it wanted to contribute more to um, super ethics. Same, the concept of willful blindness. You know, we have an incredible uh, capacity, again, homo sapiens, all of us, including myself, right? I, I'm not um, trying to, to uh, exclude myself here. On the contrary, I'm, I know I am capable of doing this. To ignore damage by not taking it into account or not measuring it or, you know, uh, relocating the costs to another post so you don't, you don't get, you know, the overall uh, perspective. Um, in the 19th century, willful blindness started becoming a legal concept, uh, sometimes also called deliberate indifference. So there's this opportunity that you have for knowledge. There's a responsibility to be informed, but you just don't do or you do when you forget very quickly. I know that flying is bad. I give a lot of talks. I still travel. Bad. Nah, yeah, it's true. I feel guilty when I get in the plane and as soon as I give my talk, I forget about it. Uh, that's, that's a human behavior that we can see regularly, even with people, I'm not talking about myself now, that we would consider to be good in general. You know, But it's still easy to forget the bad things or the bad consequences of your own behavior. 
And cognitive neuroscience, of course, studies a lot of moral uh, circuitry in the brain. Processing uh, of moral sensitivity, uh, antisocial, violent, psychopathic behavior. There's a lot of work in those fields, but that's more the extreme cases. You know, that's not, let's say, the common sense, banality of evil kind of topics that we all partake in on a regular basis. We know a lot about how morally good versus bad actions are being evaluated. What happens in our brain when we do this kind of thing? So here there's someone dropping a coin into a beggar's cup uh, and here he's kicking it away. You can immediately see that uh, different brain circuitries are you know, responding differently to those kind of behaviors. That's useful knowledge. It could form a basis for a lot of the more extended kind of scientific research. Computational mechanisms, this is from someone from the Donders, Alan Sanfi, who's been doing great work in that field for, for decades already. Where you can maybe make distinctions between moral optimism in quietly averse or guilt averse subjects on the basis of uh, neuroscientific patterns. So there's a lot of research that is there uh, we start to understand the mechanisms behind these moral sensitivities and judgments and decisions and aberrations. But if you look at the, let's say, more common kind of weaknesses in our moral behavior, then take willful blindness or overcompliance, cognitive fracture, the kind of concept that I mentioned earlier, then I don't see so much systematic work there. It's, it's isolated uh, islands. And when you look at AI work on ethical tools, it's practically absent. You have ethical hacking that, that you can find. Uh, but, but, you know, the kind of apps that would help me in being a better human, let's say, because I want to. I, I, I searched seriously in Apple Store uh, for, for ethical apps. I could find only one. And with all due respect to the makers, uh, I really appreciated the effort. It was the only one I could find, so, so glory to them. Uh, but it was not very useful. What you do see, however, is a lot of work on dark patterns, you know, where, where we use our, our knowledge about human brain and human psychology to make websites such that you do what is bad for you and what is good for Jeff Bezos or his companions. So, so you see a lot of AI, the brightest of our generation, working on tricks to manipulate people. Yeah, the dystopian um, view that was already formulated. So we don't need that. What we need is moral crutches. So again, problem of homo sapiens, looking at ourselves as a species and doing a serious self-diagnosis. I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think it's to formulate ethical values or rules. Our weakness is that we don't put them into practice. And so what we are lacking is a technology that supports us in promoting and endorsing the values that we say we have. And in a way, we know how you should do that. Aristotle, famous philosopher, long time ago, later than the period, pyramids, but still, uh, he, he already formulated that ethical conduct depends on habit formation. And it's just like with fitness. You know, you have to do it regularly. Then it works. If you don't do it regularly, like me, forget about it. So where are the tools for well-informed, science-based, ethical self-improvement? Why don't we have that? If I would be a historian from I don't know how many years in the future, I would be looking back at the 21st century, I would think that's what they need not super intelligence. So just to avoid a few misunderstandings, it's not about a magic bullet app, you know, that would uh, solve all the ethical issues for everyone. I don't believe in that because that would be a form of manipulating people into a sort of common behavior. That's not the point. There should be identical uh, individual variety. It's also not about an artificial moral agent that would take over the ethical decision making for us. No. We're supposed to behave ethically, right? And we should not be manipulated into doing what something else tells us that's the super intelligent solution. No, it's our own responsibility. I'm also not talking about kind of ethical doping, you know, with pharmaceuticals that make us more, more, more caring. I, no, that's again, the wrong way of doing it. 
let alone brain stimulation, you know, that zaps you into being good. I, I think you, that would be possible, but it would be pointless because part of the point of self-improvement is that you try to do it yourself and that you work for it and that you overcome your own weaknesses. There's something like personal growth involved here. It's not just, you know, doing the easy part. So that's why I think the fitness apps provide a very nice comparison. And the funny thing is, I, I don't know about you, but, but I like to lie on a couch and I'm running again on my old day. I shouldn't, but, but I cannot help myself. And then it's really nice to have an app that sort of tells you that it's time to run or at least show you how much you ran or, you know, these data little thingies that sort of get you off your couch. And there's an enormous market for it. It's a billion dollar industry. So where is the billion dollar industry for ethical apps? It's our most urgent uh, technology that's lacking. Uh, why don't we have that? Well, there's no pool of the market. There's no economic incentive. But we need it so much. So that's why I think, and I'm really closing down now, it's time. Uh, I hope you understand why I say down with intelligence and hooray for ethics. And that I think that unifying cognitive neuroscience and artificial intelligence is a brilliant idea. And I think the time is ripe, but we really need to ask ourselves, how can we use that combination, that enormous power in these two disciplines for good instead of for bad? Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It was really fascinating. Um, we have a question uh, from Max Palmatuzel, who would like to uh, come on stage to ask his question. By all means. While this happens, I would also like to thank you for the wonderful presentation and talk. I think it's very, very relevant for all of us doing uh, something around AI and neuroscience. And it raises a lot of important questions and topics. marie are we getting Max on, on screen? Yes. Yeah. So marie by the way, is doing a lot of work behind the scenes, helping with... Uh... Ah, there we go. Hi. Hi. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, there's so many things that you talked about that are so fascinating. I, I sort of didn't know what to, to ask about, but let me, let me just ask um, this one question, which popped up um, sort of midway through your talk. Um, so you were emphasizing a sort of neurocognitive AI approach to understanding the aspects of human behavior that impact these sort of a, a variety of types of societal approaches and this sort of, I guess, maybe currently these types of problems are more addressed by sort of psycho, social, societal, um, economic uh, approaches. And I was wondering um, how you see the sort of neuro uh, scientific AI approach um, as providing benefits beyond those, the, the sort of psycho, social, societal approaches um in 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 light of the potentially higher uh risks that uh that they might bring and it's so you know it's 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 one thing to for facebook to to sort of sort of have a have a bunch of metadata on the psychology of its users but it would be another to sort of have neuroscientific information about real um, biases and sort of bugs that, that can be exploited. Totally. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I, I, I think, and I, I tried to hint at that too during the talk, that we don't have a very good systematic uh, psychological approach to, uh, let's say, forms of uh, everyday altruism. Uh, we have some incidental studies 
and maybe extreme forms of altruism can be studied, but but also psychologically, behaviorally, there's no you know concerted effort in trying to to study the mechanisms. Um, so that's one, and second, the problem precisely is that the way we're using cognitive neuroscience now is augmenting the risks. You know, when Elon Musk wants to do BCI in smartphones, I am getting seriously concerned. And when Facebook adds to that, I'm not seriously concerned, I'm in panic. You know, that's sort of the worst of the worst. So, so um, that is my problem. What we need is, on the contrary, a concerted effort against those kind of attempts, like in neuromarketing and stuff like that, to use all that knowledge to to get even more economical profit and nudging, etc., for financial gain, which is exactly what is happening now. So, of course, what neuroscience adds to a lot of uh, psychological studies, or could add, at least in theory, is that you have a better understanding of at least part of the causal mechanisms underlying the behavior. You know, so I, I'm saying part because I believe very strongly in embodied embedded cognition. So I, I don't like neurocentrism. We're much more than our brain, uh, if you ask me, at least. Uh, so, so that's why I always say it's part of the solution, but it's undeniable that, that I think at least that the brain plays a crucial role in connecting input-output in certain ways that are pretty sophisticated and that you could use to understand better at which moments we sort of ignore while we actually are quite well aware of the negative effects of what we're doing. So this willful blindness, for instance. And those kind of mechanisms I would like to see studied, but not by Facebook, you know, uh, or by Elon Musk, but by academics that are funded by maybe more neutral organizations, not to make a create an economic product that they can can use for financial gain, but, but to support those who wish. So if there's no pull of the market, as I said, like we have for fitness apps, uh, for moral apps, then why don't we ask for funding to create them nonetheless? Right? I mean, that would be, uh, and I don't think that Elon Musk or uh, Jeff Bezos would be interested in that because it goes contrary to their way of making money. Well, that's maybe why we need, I don't know, government funding. That would be a way of, of, of trying, and you could consistently, and you should consistently ask and evaluate whether it would live up to all the ethical standards that we so nicely formulate in all these ethical codes. You know, so that, that would be um, part of my reply. Does that help in any way? For a model where all the knowledge generated is, is open, but that via regulation, its, its use is, is somehow uh, sort of narrowed onto the applications that, that are beneficial. Yeah, and, and apart from that, I also believe that every individual user should be allowed and 100% capable of deleting any information that would get collected in the process, uh, which is also not what we have now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when it comes to neuroscientific data, I wrote about that in a couple of recent papers. Uh, there should be really highly, you know, uh, encompassing guarantees that the data remain with the owner. In that sense, mm -hmm. I think we're, we're in a very strange situation where the data is uh, primarily of someone else because you clicked OK in a way that is a dark pattern following kind of design. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay, it, it, so it, and that's you. also why it, it needs um, a, a really a concerted effort. This is not something that you do uh, with an individual app or something. This requires really long time planning, I would think. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Charlotte Maschke, and she's gonna come on screen to ask her question. Shouldn't take long. Yeah, and in the meantime, just a reminder for all participants that you can ask your questions and ask a question, and also upvote the questions of others there. Hi, Charlotte. Oh, hi. Thank you hi. so much for this really, really interesting talk. It was 
so fascinating to hear this. Um, so my question is especially about the first part of your presentation and your focus of the presentation on artificial intelligence. And I want you to redirect like all the topic to artificial consciousness to ask mm. on your opinion about this. So do you think that better understanding consciousness might help us to address this egoism and speciesism in the humans? maybe even the insight that consciousness is just not not just a human uh, property not just a human characteristic but it's like spread much more uh, widely could this yeah. be would change human behavior mm, it might i think it's also part of the how do you say that it's part of the support for my diagnosis that we're so overly fascinated by intelligence that we don't make much progress in understanding consciousness it's it's very funny in a way we 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 have these machines that are super smart and we work really very hard to make them even smarter whereas in terms of sentience both in understanding and recreating we're not capable of doing it they're zero the smartest computer still feels as much as the refrigerator which is basically zero that tells me something about what we as a species find interesting about ourselves. And of course, for me, consciousness is very much related to empathy, love, feeling. Um, I'm not surprised maybe that we don't understand that all that well, because where, how do you make money out of that? You can. I mean, Hollywood does it with the sort of, uh, you know, the, the love uh, movie uh, kind of uh, machine to extract money but but it's a it's a complicated kind of thing so yes i think um this is part of the task that we need to address and indeed also just like intelligence is spread out over a lot of species i cannot understand people who would claim that animals don't have sentience or consciousness i i, I how on earth and of course you can argue that at some point it might become less in degrees and I personally have my moments of higher and lower levels of consciousness too, uh, you know. Um, but for me, it's not an important question where to draw the line. I, I would like to be as inclusive as possible. You know, the the, the, the California Aplicia, for all I care, has, has consciousness. How oh, that's 20,000 neurons. Uh, I'm not even sure about the E. coli. You know, it, it works its way towards food and away from toxics. Uh, is that a desire? as long as we don't know for sure why not take uh, no risks and be inclusive i don't see the problem there but it's 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 part of the problem that we don't study these things so well and of course we would have to be careful at the same time because the moment you create a machine with at least a moderate degree of sentience it would have it would start to get rights immediately um and that is a price that maybe people are not willing to pay. I, I once was involved in a little ethical uh, suggestion for the Human Brain Project, you know, in the time when they were really thinking about uh, that's the one billion European project to, to rebuild a brain in uh, computational modeling. And I said, look, if you really take serious your own ambition and you would be successful, you would lose your supercomputers because you, you would not be allowed to switch it off. Did you think about that? Is there something paradoxical about your own aims? Uh, I didn't get funded. That was a pity. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have another. We have a question from uh, by uh, Karim, right? Oh. Karim, do you want to come on stage? You can write it on the chat. All right, we'll bring you on. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Pim, for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, I had a very quick question. I, so I, I understand for the sake of argument that you're opposing intelligence on one hand and ethics on the other. Um, and you're aiming more at saying, well, the, the goal should not be more intelligence, rather more of the ethics. Um, and I was just wondering whether um, instead of opposing them, we can also see points where they actually go hand in hand. For Specifically, I'm thinking about collective intelligence. 
So if you see collective intelligence as an opportunity for positive ethical implications that might arise from sort of a, some form of mass or collective intelligence, I was wondering what you're thinking, um, what you think about that. Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that um, to do some sort of constructive future-oriented ethics, I hear myself back. So maybe this should be a mic. Yeah, thanks. So if you want to do some future-oriented type of ethics, then intelligence really helps. You know, how are you going to plan for the future otherwise on the basis of past experiences without the capacity to, to extrapolate, for instance. So, so intelligence in that sense comes with, with ethics. Um, but I think currently the, the backlog, the, the, the sort of um, uh, the distance between what we know about intelligence and what we know about ethical behavior, especially, is such that we really need to bring more balance in these two. So I would say, and I, I sometimes make a joke at my own Department of Artificial Intelligence to the director, we should stop the Department of Artificial Intelligence and we should start the Department of Artificial Ethics except that I would like it to be human ethics, to be perfectly honest. He doesn't like that suggestion, and I know it's not serious, but, but this is really, we need to catch up with what we know about intelligence before we can start integrating them well. We would now be integrating too much with too little, if you understand my idea. And the collective point is a very crucial thing here, eh? I mean, we know that human beings are very social creatures and that most of our ethics in some sense or other is also understandable as a form of political reputation management. I want to look good and I can explain things about why I did uh, certain things to one group differently than to another. I remember when I was at high school, I would explain my behavior to my parents in a different way than to my friends. It was the same behavior, but, but I used other arguments and other concepts, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that is capable of doing that. That's the reputation management. So we have to be also honest about what ethics means, that it's very much a social phenomenon. And so this, this, this human interaction or human-animal interaction too, there's a lot of ethics in human-animal interaction at an individual level, um, that needs to be studied more including the sort of neurocognitive, psychological, behavioral, brain-related aspects there. Yeah, so that's an, a, a very much an open field. Uh, your, uh, your, yes. If the time is up, there's no problem. I'll, I'll, okay, so very briefly, I was just so to take this argument of the collective intelligence just one step further. And I was wondering if we agree or if you believe that most human beings, if we take the masses, that most people have a, a strong commitment to defending values such as equality, justice, um, having a, a climate that will survive for our future generations. If the masses, I'm not talking about those that are making money out of these things not happening, uh, or those that are selling weapons, but if the masses, if, if most people have that commitment, or at least they would like to see that, if they have the AI tools that empower them, like we see in sometimes in organizing revolutions, how the people take the social media and turn them towards their advantage to organize. Um, is that one way how AI can be a tool for social good and for social change towards justice? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because, of course, you can think this um, and you can mean it, but then the next day at nine o'clock, you have to get out of, from your couch and you have to start running, you know, and that sometimes hurts. And it's the same with ethics. You can, you can believe it with all your heart and then still decide to fly to go on a holiday because you deserve it or you feel that you deserve it. And it's at those weak moments that we need maybe these moral crutches, as I call them, technology mediated, that will help us to remain strong. It's precisely at your weak moments that you need these apps, right? Otherwise, you just do it. Then it's easy. Um, and we all have our weak moments. And the problem is that we have more weak moments, being only human beings, than strong moments. Uh, that's, that's why, you know, so, of course, you have the really bad people, but that's a minority. The majority wants to do good, but is very often, myself included, incapable of doing that consistently enough to make it work. Well, 
how do we understand those mechanisms, the effect of context, the effect of other agents, and the way our brains are tuned to, to deal with those circumstances? That's, that's the research challenge, I think. And that would be a, a valuable goal, I would think, for an integrated CNS AI. And not a simple one, because the risks, as one of the previous uh, persons asked, are, of course, considerable. If you understand more about this, the chances for manipulation will grow. But the problem, of course, is that we already see that happening. Again, think about neuromarketing. That, do we want Jeff Bezos to understand our brain processes and then sell more stuff? I, I personally, I don't know the guy, but I don't, I'm, that doesn't make me feel happy. Uh, but it's happening because he pays the research. So where's the counterbalancing kind of research? That's, that's the, the difficult question that we need to address really now, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Karim. Um, we have about nine more minutes for questions. Uh, well, we'll wait for questions. I have one. It's, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, which follows up on, on this discussion. But uh, I, I completely agree with uh, the with need for, for more ethics and, and catching up with ethics because before we move on with uh, trying to understand intelligence. But uh, I have this maybe pessimistic or negative view that, well, the economic system we live in mm. actually uh, incentivizes the opposite to me, as I understand it. Yes. Like we are, yeah, ethics is not something that, that, uh, that capitalism uh, asks for. And actually, I think some of the values and principles of it are kind of orthogonal to, to the ethics we or you are striving yeah. for. And, and what's worse, and this is kind of what, what I would like to, to hear your thoughts about, which is this has now entered, or these logics have now entered into the realm of research, which somehow had, had stayed a bit uh, uh, outside of that, of these logics. And now we have, for example, a lot of the AI, AI research controlled and funded by, by corporations, huge corporations that, yes. of course, don't, don't don't care about these ethics. And actually, as a matter of fact, as soon as there's someone uh, pushing for more ethics, then they are canceled or fired or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so I know this is indeed the problem. And this is why I think society at large, and this is something that you see in the European Union with the General Data Protection Regulation, for instance, which was in practice you know, you can discuss, but at least in theory, it was a principled kind of statement. Um, that you say, look, if you really mean it in that way, then the funding for these kind of ethics-oriented CNS AI kind of combination should not come from companies or from the startups or from the products, but the government should focus on that. And so at the very least, there will be um, a minority, but at least a substantial minority that makes a systematic and concerted effort in trying to develop these moral crutches that we as a society need. I don't think we can expect Facebook to make them, right? I, or Google, I, I uh, again, I don't know the people personally, but even if I would, I don't think it would make a big difference. So, so you already know that there it's not gonna happen. Well then, as a government, as a European Union, uh, you think and you worry about the kind of problems that we're collectively uh, sort of walking right into or continue to walk right into is probably better. Um, well, put your money then for those kind of departments that try to address these kind of issues. So I don't think we should fund, uh, really my department would, will not be happy when I say this, you know, should fund trying to improve the effectivity of uh, deep learning neural networks. There's other people doing that in far better ways than us. What we should do at the university from public money is try to create those moral crutches that will work towards a better society. That would be something that you can fund as a government. Uh, yeah. Um, so I agree with your pessimism in that sense. It's not going to happen uh, out there in a, a capitalistic or you know large multinational kind of environment. 
So scientists should uh, lobby funding agencies, or how should, how yeah. should it work? Well, well, I in the Netherlands, my 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 um, how do you say that? My reach is very limited, but I do get to talk with Ministry of Economics and, and stuff like that in the, in the Netherlands, and that's where I tell them this. Uh, like, if you want AI and CNS to work for the good, then this is my diagnosis, wrong as it may be, but this is the best I can come up with of what we need in terms of applications based on neuroscience and AI. And I don't see it happening. And it's not going to happen in the big companies. So if you want this to happen, you know, I have to fund it. And that would be society's money, I think, applied to products that would actually be... Um, well, at the very least, less bad than a lot of the other stuff that we see uh, being developed. It's not going to be easy, eh? that's pretty sure. No, for sure it's no. not. But well, yeah. at, least, at least we can discuss it. And, and that's why, again, sorry, uh, I, I'm, I'm so, so happy to be here with this, uh, you know, unifying AI and cognitive neuroscience. If anything fits, I think, in terms of value, um, then it's this. If it doesn't happen here, then where? Yeah, I agree. And uh, that's why I think your talk and hearing about this for this uh, particular audience is uh, super important. So thank you for that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, by Cesar Cañaveral. OK, uh, sh should I read it? Um, so. They are asking, what books would you recommend to someone that want to get further insights on the topic of neural ethics? So some uh, some literature. Yeah. Well, what what I like and don't like. Okay. So there's no there's no great there's no perfect book, um, unfortunately. Uh, but um, what I liked was the sort of uh, first part of Jonathan Hyde's book. Even though I am not always agreeing with where he takes it but about um, what he calls descriptive ethics, where he has a very basic sort of slightly cynical understanding of how people talk about ethics. And this is basically what I formulated in my, um, it's sort of a political image. We use ethics to manipulate our social status. I tell you the nice things that I think you want to hear, so I increase my status within the hierarchy of which you're part. Right? So it's, it's, but at some point you have to be consistent because otherwise, you know, you don't put your money where your mouth is. And that's maybe also evolutionary. At some point, you know, you really have to walk the talk. Um, and he has a sort of theory on that basis. That, that I think is really useful precisely because it doesn't presuppose a very high ethical standard somehow inherent in human beings. I mean, history has disproven that, I think, quite consistently over the centuries. So we shouldn't fool ourselves. Um, and then on that basis, and the kind of research that I very briefly mentioned, and I just you know showed a few titles. I can give you the slides, eh, by the way, if you want uh, to... Uh, and I'm sure there's more of that kind of research, then, then that would be a good basis. But we don't have a, there's no neuro AI handbook on ethics, uh, which is a pity. You know, if we could write that together, that would be really nice. Yeah. We should. Yeah, we should, yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. there's something coming out of this uh, of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, you know, it's, I mean, uh, uh, this initiative is really potentially, and of course, it doesn't have to be the only thing. And eh? there's lots of stuff that you can do with with the combination of AI and neuroscience. But it would be a, a really nice to explore a little bit uh, how that could work, and then what would be the chapters that you would need. You know, where do you start? How? What are the risks? Again, I'm very sensitive to the risks too. Uh, so that that would be uh, yeah, would be interesting actually. Maybe we should get them back on this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm in. So, thank you so much. Yes, I'm in as Great. well. And I think uh, lots of people, as I see in the chat, lots of people are, are in as well. <laughs> well. So I just wanted to thank you again for this wonderful talk. Fascinating stuff. 
And uh, so we're now going to take a quick break, a five minute break. We're going to come back at uh, 2.20 for the lightning talks. And Prof. Asalahar will join us as well at uh, in the panel at the end of the day. So, uh, so yeah, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you again. Thank you.